Good morning. Today we are in the book of the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs. Um, this may be one of the most neglected books in the Bible. Uh, when you read through it without much study or without much thought, you think, hmm, why did we put this in the holy canon? How did it make it throughout the years? Especially considering that Solomon is the author. Um, and yet, the more I studied uh, and the more I read, uh, the more I was convicted that this really is a lesson for us and that this principle far extends beyond just the initial reading. I want you, as we do in pairs and spares before we begin any study, I want you to go back to the table of contents in your Bible. I think it's really important when you start a book to know where it is, uh, who it's written by, what's it for, uh, and very quickly, we're going to review the Old Testament. Those first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, are the books of law, um, the Torah. They have uh, wonderful stories of uh, the beginning of the Hebrew nation. From Joshua down to Esther, we have what are historical books very specific stories about specific times, uh, the story of the kings, of the judges, the history of uh, the values that Judeo-Christian principles are built upon. And then a very interesting insertion from Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon, we have this insertion of literary books books of wisdom, such as Proverbs. We'll get into that a little bit more when we talk about Solomon himself. And then from Isaiah to the end of the Old Testament, those are all prophets, men of God who received the Word of God, messages to his people, and they presented to his people the Word of God. So, the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon, is the third book that we have written by King Solomon or compiled by King Solomon uh, sometime between 970 and 930 B.C. Uh, I don't know how your Bible has it listed uh, in this New Living Translation. It's called the Song of Songs, which is... Um, a way of saying superlative. This is the best of the songs. We know that Solomon wrote a thousand five songs. So out of all of those, this is number one. Those other thousand and four somehow fall below this. Um, it is a book by or about or for Solomon. Um, the Song of Songs being the superlative, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, uh, Holy of Holies, the Song of Songs. This is the absolute cream of the crop. There are uh, interesting uh, people, interesting characters in this book. I have them listed. Uh, the first is the Shulamite girl. She's referred to as the Beloved. She's almost a Cinderella figure. She's the star of the book. She is a country girl living in, Sh in uh, the area of the Shulamites. She would be in the northern part of Israel. She was made to work by her half-brothers, by her step-brothers, uh, tending the vineyard, attending uh, the family vineyard, uh, herding the goats. That was her job. Uh, she was a little insecure about her appearance. Um, she, she refers to the fact that she had been out tending the vineyards. And in verse 6 of chapter 1, it says, My brothers were angry with me. They forced me to care for their vineyards, so I couldn't care for myself, my own vineyard. She 
worked so hard that she neglected herself. Um, she meets the king, she meets her lover, and her hard work and her social status, she's a little self-conscious about. But she is in love, and she dreams about her lover. She speaks to him and about him in some of the most wonderfully romantic, intimate terms. She's a young girl, and she has dreams. Um, the second character in this book, or in these song lyrics, is the bride. Uh, I'm sorry, the groom, or the man, the young man. Uh, we presume that to be Solomon. He is a wealthy king. Perhaps he even owns the land that her family is tending because his herds were next to hers and that's how they met. He sweeps her off of her feet and he is totally enthralled with her. Um, these lovers are the only ones in the world for each other. Their focus is totally on each other. Now you say Solomon, okay, Solomon had 700 wives, 300 concubines. Is this the first of the 700? I don't know, but let's, let's think about that for a second. Solomon wrote this perhaps very early in his life. Early in his life when uh, love was pure and love was innocent and um, love was beautiful. Because the next writing that we have from Solomon, which actually appears first in scripture, is Ecclesiastes. If you read through Ecclesiastes, you're gonna think, man, what a sad um, man. Uh, he is obviously in a midlife crisis. He questions everything about his life. He questions uh, where he's been and how he's been and, and who he's been with. It, it's a, a sad commentary. And then we also have these, this group of, of proverbs that were written by, credited to Solomon. Um, and, and in those proverbs, we have a wisdom that reflects back on his life and the lessons that he's learned. So if we think of Solomon in those terms with the Song of Songs being in his youth, in his innocent youth, when love was love and it was not messed up by life, uh, and then we think of Ecclesiastes where he is thinking back over his life and, and questioning things that he has done and things that have happened to him. And then we end up in Proverbs, uh, much as our Pears and Spares class and all of us old wise people who can look back and, and, and think about lessons that we've learned in life. And you know, if we could sit down and, and tell our children and our grandchildren, this is, this is what life is gonna do and this is how you have to prevent, prevent it then we can understand Proverbs. So, so these three writings that are credited to Solomon, I think are in reverse order. Um, I want us to think of Song of Songs as being written when Solomon's love was pure and it was focused on one person and it was glorious. We just, we have to take it at face value um, before life messes messes up his life. Uh, the third group is a group of people, and it's uh, the young women are the daughters of Jerusalem. Uh, and I really think in a modern term, we would call them groupies. It, it's a group of young women who are obviously unexperienced in love. Um, they are living vicariously through this, this bride. And watching her relationship develop with this king. Uh, obviously, probably a little covetous, but, um, but watching from afar. And, and their lyrics are um, Af 
affirmation or wonder about what is happening in, in the life of, of this couple. Uh, the fourth group is, is mentioned twice, and it's the brothers. Uh, the first one we've already talked about, which, which were the, the brothers who were angry. They were either her half-brothers or her step-brothers, uh, and they are keeping her busy. They're, they're making her work. Uh, she, she is not a sister that is um, uh, protected and, and comforted. She, she's having to work. And, and participate in, in making a way for the family. The next group of, of brothers, and, and we can assume they're the same brothers, but they appear in chapter 8 at the, the end of the book, verses 8 and 9, um, and, and they become her protectors. Um, if she were... Um, young and innocent, then they would protect her. If she was promiscuous, um, they would be barring the doors to keep to keep the boys away. They, they are her protectors. I'm not sure if that's the same group of brothers, but they're characters in this story that, that deserve to be mentioned. Um, the, the next group is a group that I didn't find in any of my references, but it, it was a um, an entity that really interest me, interested me. In chapter 2 and verse 15, the young women of Jerusalem, these daughters of Jerusalem, mention foxes. Uh, they say, catch all the foxes, those little foxes, before they ruin the vineyard of love, for the grapevines are blooming. And I thought, what a fox or a jackal, as it's referred to in, in the King James, um, what is that about? Well, they're pests. And, and their uh, goal is obviously to destroy or to harm this relationship, um, this, this beautiful relationship that is developing between this man and this woman. Uh, these young women warn this couple to be careful I think of outside influences that can hurt that relationship. Uh, if we're thinking about a relationship of love, I, I, I just think of people who get so busy with life that they forget about each other. You know, when you're newly a new parent and your kids have got you going in every different direction and, and, and they'll tell you, have a date night, get together with your spouse. Don't forget each other. Don't let life become so overbearing that you forget the foundation, or your purpose, your home. Don't forget that. Um, and then the last group, uh, the group of watchmen, in chapter 5 uh, and verse 7, we'll talk about this in, in a minute, but there is um, a glip, a first glitch, in, in the relationship, and uh, she turns the groom away, he leaves, and so she goes out to search for him. And um, beginning chapter five, and let's look at verse six. It says, I opened to my lover, but he was gone. So he's, he's left. My heart sank. I searched for him, but couldn't find him anywhere. I called to him, but there was no reply. So apparently she goes out into the streets to look for him because she says, the night watchmen, and this is plural, found me as they made their rounds. So apparently these are guards, perhaps of the palace in, in the city. Um, they beat and bruised me and stripped off my veil. They took her protection away. They saw her identity, these watchmen on the walls. Now, that's quite a story. Um, I'm not sure if, if we think about this as an allegory where um, the, the bride is the church and the man is the groom or Christ or the Messiah. Uh, and we think about him leaving and, and the veil being uncovered, perhaps in the church finding people who are... Um, 
infiltrating the church and, and spreading uh, dishonest doctrine. Perhaps that's what it's talking about. But, but in any event, there is in this story the idea of a protection uh, over the city and over the community. Um, I think that's valuable. So, so we have two bad guys. We have the foxes and the watchmen. And, and then we have these other characters. The plot in eight chapters, I'm going to give you in a couple of sentences. Uh, the country girl is out working. She's working hard. A shepherd comes and he sees her and it is love at first sight. They fall in love with each other and the, the story, the, the lyrics that are used express their desire to be intimate with each other, to love each other. Um, it is amazing. He leaves, but he promises to return. Um, and in his absence, she dreams about him. She pines away. Uh, there's an entire chapter devoted to her dreams about him and how she cannot wait to be with him and be intimate with him. Um, they are, he returns, and they are united in a mad, passionate love. So there's the story of the courtship, of the wedding, and, and then the marriage. Um, the, the romantic courtship begins in chapters one through the first part of chapter three. And there's this exchange of dialogue that exists between the, the, the prospective groom and the prospective bride, the young man and the young woman. And, and they are so focused on each other and so devoted to each other and so anxious to be intimate with each other. Uh, one, one interesting fact, in chapter 1 and verse 5, um, she frets over the fact that she has a dark tan because she's been out working. She's sunburned. She, her hands are, are probably coarse. Um, it says, dark as the tents of Kedar dark as the curtains of Solomon's tents. And when I think of tent, I think of a, a, a aluminum poles and a white top. But obviously, this would have been the tent of a worker. So the tent material would have been made out of the goats or the sheep that were available in that area, which would have been dark. They were dark colored. So, so she you know, she worries, she's insecure about this area that she's from and the work that she's done. Um, and terribly sad about the fact that she's not um, lily white, pure um, princess. Uh, she's not. Um, the proposal happens in chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, she's speaking and she says, My lover said to me, Rise up, my darling. Come away with me, my fair one. Um, and he repeats it again later in, in verse 13. He says, rise up, darling, come away with me, my fair one. He addresses that insecurity that she has and, and tells her, hey, it's okay. I love you and, and we are going to be together. Chapter 3, and verses 6 through 10, the, the daughters of Jerusalem, or the young women who are watching this, uh, address the arrival of this king to, to claim his bride. And I, I don't want to read it. It's worth it. Uh, verse 6, chapter 3, it says, Who is this sweeping in from the wilderness like a cloud of smoke? Who is it, fragrant with myrrh and frankincense and every kind of spice? Look, it is Solomon's carriage, surrounded by 60 heroic men, the best of Israel's soldiers. They are all skilled swordsmen, experienced warriors. Each wears a sword on his thigh, ready to defend the king against an attack in the night. King Solomon's carriage is built of wood imported from Lebanon, finest of everything. Its posts are silver, its canopy gold, its cushions are purple. It was decorated with love by the young women of Jerusalem. Man, what a carriage. 
what, what a wonderful way to be carried away uh, for, for your wedding. Chapter 4, the young man speaks of this woman that he's in love with. And he addresses and describes every part of her body. And what a description it is. Uh, I had a hard time getting past the very first verse. He says, you are beautiful, my darling, beautiful beyond words. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Uh, okay, I'm not sure I really followed that, so Googled doves' eyes. And it turns out, uh, not only might they be a pretty color, um, but a dove's eyes don't go from side to side or up and down. They're focused straight ahead. They, they have to turn their head to see, not their eyes. And I thought, well, how neat. Maybe he's talking about the fact that she is so focused on him. Uh, not, not just the appearance of her eyes, but the function of her eyes and her heart to be totally focused on him and the intimacy that they want to share. He, um, if, if you go on through the chapter, he, he compares her hair to a flock of goats. Doesn't sound like a big deal to us, but in that day, in that time, it was glorious. My favorite, my favorite in the whole book is verse 2. Your teeth are as white as sheep, recently shorn and freshly washed. Your smile is flawless. Each tooth matched with its twin. Ladies, she had all her teeth. I mean, this is just a great story. And he appreciates every fine and wonderful thing about her. He goes into great detail um, to explain the love that he shares for her. Love it. Um, Chapter 5 and verse 2, um, we have the fox appear, um, and we have that glitch in, in the relationship that, that I talked about earlier. Um, he comes to her for intimacy, uh, and she turns him away. Uh, chapter 5 and verse 3, she has some excuses. She doesn't want to get up and get dressed again. Uh, she's already washed. She doesn't want to get her feet dirty. Uh, she has a headache, whatever, whatever expression she uses. She just doesn't respond um, in the way he expected. And so the next thing you know, in verse 4, uh, she gets the door unlatched and he's gone. Uh, she searches and searches for him. Uh, in verse 8, she addresses these, these young women and she says, Make this promise, O women of Jerusalem. If you find my lover, tell him I am weak with love. Um, and she goes on to describe him and his body and everything that she imagines with him. Uh, he returns. They have a wonderful reunion that is um, intimate and beautiful and glorious, and they are reunited, um, and all seems to be well. Uh, love, rejection, and reunion. Now, if this story, if these lyrics, if this song is an allegory of Christ and his church, with the church being the bride, the young woman, and Christ being uh, the beloved, the man, um, coming to, to get his church after a separation, uh, and expressing the love that Christ must have felt for us um, to have given his life for us. Um, what a beautiful expression of love and devotion and commitment that he had. Um, beautiful story. Chapters 5 and, and, and 6 and 7 go to that, that reunion uh, 
So what, what, are, what are we supposed to learn? What is today's church, today's body of believers, supposed to learn from Song of Songs? Well, first off, physical intimacy between a husband and a wife is a gift from God. Enjoy it. Love it. Love each other. Uh, don't be um, swayed by the culture of sex that the world gives. It, it's a difference in sex with love and sex without love, which is not the same expression. Um, respect is mandatory. Um, we are built for love. We are built for commitment. Um, this is a love story of a husband and a wife. And it's a great picture of God's love for his church and what love means and what commitment means. Um, I like to end in chapter 8, verse 6. I think this is a, a glorious way. It says, Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, which would be where everyone could see it. For love is as strong as death, it's jealousy as enduring as the grave. If we could be committed um, to our husbands, to our spouses, um, as this young bride was to Solomon, how great it would be. Next week, we will begin the history of Isaiah. Uh, we'll start, actually, the study of Isaiah, the book itself, the week after. But next week, we're going to begin with some of that history and get that out of the way because that's my favorite part. Thank you.